We're going to jump in now right to our first panel, uh, which is uh, the panel is about what are the uh, what are the challenges today that we face in the clean energy space, what some people call the clean energy crisis, and how do we think about not just bringing cost, bringing technology down cost curves, but as Arun said, how do we get new cost curves that are going to be able to bring prices down even more? Uh, our moderator is Mark Gunther, who is uh, with uh, Fortune Magazine. He's a contributing editor at Fortune, uh, and he's a senior writer at GreenBiz.com and a blogger at the Energy Collective. Uh, Mark is also the author of several books, including Faith and Fortune, How Compassionate Capitalism is Transforming American Business, and he's a graduate of Yale University. Mark? Great. Thank you, Rob. I wonder if this podium can be moved back a little and, yeah. you know, maybe easier. Why don't we all just get up and move over one while they do that so I can see the folks yeah, over there. Great. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Our topic is cost curves, crisis, and capabilities. Somehow those all got tied together, I guess, by the letter C, if nothing else. Uh, we've got a diverse panel, different backgrounds, different points of view. Let me introduce them to you quickly, and we'll get right to it. Um, in the middle there is retired Vice Admirable, Admiral Denny McGinn. Then he spent 35 years in the Navy as a naval aviator, a test pilot, commanding officer on an aircraft carrier, and commander ultimately of the Third Fleet, which was responsible for 50 million square miles of the Pacific Ocean. He did a quick stint in private industry and this year uh, became president of ACOR. You're probably familiar with that, the American Council on Renewable Energy. To my immediate right is uh, Dr. Tonio Buonasisi. Antonio comes to us from MIT, he's an engineer, his focus is uh, research on solar photovoltaics. He has a PhD from Berkeley and did a brief stint at Evergreen Solar up in Massachusetts. <laughs> and over there on the far right is Devin Sweezy. Devin comes from Breakthrough Institute, uh, maybe best known as author of a, a paper that got a lot of attention, I guess it was last year, called Rising Tigers and Sleeping Giant about the clean energy competition between the U.S. and Asia. Uh, he's written for Business Week and Forbes.com as well as Breakthrough. So, crisis, cost curves, capabilities. You're probably the uh, crisis expert on the panel, Denny, after 35 years in the military. Um, are we in a crisis? And when it comes to energy and climate, and if so, how would you define that crisis? I believe we are in a, a crisis, and one of the challenges is that uh, it's a slow rising uh, crisis yeah, yeah. that basically is um, affecting our national security in the broadest sense of the uh, term. Uh, our traditional military security, our diplomatic leverage, and our economic security, and our quality of life. There's a nexus between national security in that definition and climate security at the local, regional, and uh, global levels. The problem is that uh, we've gotten a little bit complacent about uh, volatility of gas prices, uh, Dr. Majumdar mentioned uh, the, our over-dependence, our addiction to uh, oil, especially for the transportation sector. We see amazing 500-year name of natural phenomenon uh, stories that are happening uh, every few years instead of every 500 years. <coughs> we see uh, the uh, compelling science that is uh, subscribed to by greater than 97% uh, of the uh, engineering, scientific societies, both government and private sector, about, uh, about climate change and that it's real and that uh, we all have a role in it, especially the way in which we get and use energy. So these are very real challenges. And uh, in my role as the vice chairman of the military advisory board, we have documented these challenges, climate, economic, national security, and recently, at the beginning of this month, in fact, we came out with a new report that focused on transportation security. It was the 30% solution assuring freedom of movement. It's at cna.org. I'm not making a plug uh, per se, but I'm saying for an, a group that is focused on energy innovation, 
Uh, it is a very, very uh, rich body of uh, work that has a lot of references and can help to uh, point the way for America from a national security imperative to do something about increasing our portfolio of uh, transportation energy. One of my colleagues on the Military Advisory Board, uh, General Ron Keyes from Air Force, is uh, with us today. And uh, he's going to be available to answer any questions that you might have about this report. <laughs> so the, go so, ahead, Danny. So to, to kind of wrap it up, yeah, we're, this is a crisis, but it's one that isn't uh, like Pearl Harbor or it isn't one like Sputnik, it isn't one like uh, what happened 10 years ago on 9-11 that is riveting in its attention. It is slow rising, but it is inevitable. And unlike those three crises that I just mentioned, it will not only affect a large portion of the United States, it will affect everyone. And it will not affect uh, everyone for just a few years. It will be decades. So we are in a crisis and and uh, we need to do something about it. It's very compelling. You know, you mentioned to me last night that you'd been in energy, or interested in energy, since coming back from Southeast Asia to the gas crisis of the 1970s. If you'd asked people at that time, do we have an energy crisis, most people would say yes. I, I dare say most people today might say no in the general public. Certainly, I haven't heard a lot of talk about energy in the political conversation this year. It, it, how, how do you communicate this better to it's, people? It's really... Uh, and then pull your mic up just sure. a bit. I don't think it's, it's really quite a, catching an you. It's really an amazing phenomenon in that... Uh, I'll, I'll take you back to the good old days. In September of 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit uh, the Gulf Coast. That was not the good old days. But what happened was for the first time in the history of American use of gasoline for uh, powering our, a large portion of our transportation sector, gas spiked above $3 a gallon. That's the good old days part. And we said, whoa, what's going on? We saw sales of gas guzzlers go down and you know, more energy efficient uh, uh, cho vehicle choices go up. There was a suppression uh, temporarily of uh, total vehicle miles traveled. But we forgot about it. Now we, uh, in, the f in the frog on the uh, stove, slowly, slowly getting to a boil, uh, we've just kind of gotten used to the fact that it's creeping up. Oil's uh, going above uh, 100 bucks a barrel again. And this is just uh, an inexorable trend where demand is going up, as Arun pointed out, the supply is getting tougher and more expensive and more competitive, perhaps leading to conf conflict in the future, and uh, we just uh, don't seem to have that uh, riveting moment where we are willing to do something about it as individuals and as a nation. That's not to say we can. There are many, many good solutions out there, not just for transportation, but for uh, for electricity as well. And I, I just want to make one final point. I'll do it with a poll. Show of hands. How many people here like electricity? <laughs> hey, I love it. It's really great. It'd be awful dark in here and smoky with candles and whale oil lamps if we didn't have it. So we like electricity. How many people here would not mind living with your families five miles downwind from a coal-fired power plant? I don't see any hands. So how many people would uh, not mind living five miles downwind from a wind farm or a solar farm or a hydro? So here's the deal. We like electricity, but we don't like what we have to pay for it when we consider all of the costs of how we produce a big portion of our electricity. And this business of energy innovation is just about that. It is looking to innovate technologically, financial mechanisms, policies in a way that brings together energy answers, energy solutions that take into consideration and drive down the total cost, not just the price of the utility meter or the price of the pump, but the total cost of our energy demand. Okay. Well, I want to get back to the innovation question in a minute, but first let me turn to, to Tonio. Uh, you are, come under the category of cost curves here under the title. So I was actually in, in an event yesterday uh, that the Atlantic ran on green economy, and I heard a quote, and I've heard this from other people, and I want you to comment on it. The speaker there said, solar is becoming more and more like IT, 
the solar price performance ratio has doubled in 24 months, meaning you know tw twice the performance for the same price, I think is what he was trying to say. Um, you know, on the other hand, common sense would tell you the technology has been around for half a century, and it represents what? A fraction of a percent of US electricity generation or global electricity generation. So, so what do the cost curves look like? Are we moving fast to the point where, you know, as Rob indicated, we get the real cost below fossil fuels, or is this kind of always going to be something that's five, ten years into the future? Sure. So uh, first off, I'd, I'd like to just mention that solar has been making uh, some pretty drastic progress over the last three decades. Uh, there's a next slide. I'm not sure who has control over the... Thanks, Rob. Uh, that one. Uh, the graphs are a little small You have here. control. Excellent. <laughs> uh, the graphs are a little small, but let me walk you through what you're looking at here. If you look at the bottom right figure, uh, this is the... Uh, Mike just turned on. This is a nameplate capacity uh, of uh, new U.S. electricity generation capacity in blue. Uh, pretty constant across the top there. We are adding a fairly constant amount of new electrical generation capacity each year. In red, that's the new U.S. PV installation. Uh, derated, of course, for the capacity factor. PV is not on all the time. And what you can see here is a convergence occurring, uh, ideally sometime within the next decade, within this decade, if, uh, if current growth rates continue. And uh, another interesting point is that that uh, this year we're over two and a half percent of all new electricity installs here in the United States. PV is. Uh, so it's, it's definitely becoming larger, uh, growing, and it's getting to the point where you can't ignore it anymore. Uh, when the solar panels were taken off the roof of the White House in 1987, it was but a small drop in the bucket of total new electricity generation capacity, and now we're already growing up to several percents of new electrical installs. At the same time, in the upper right-hand plot, we see the average module selling price. Now this is the price for the PV module, not for the final installation, we'll get to that in a minute, but the module itself, which comprises really the heart of the installation, the engine, if you will, that price has been decreasing fairly steadily over time. The blue dots there represent the decrease of the module uh, price. The green represents the U.S. average residential uh, electricity uh, price, or the, modules, the module price that would uh, result in grid parity for residential, and the orange for commercial. What we can see here with that black line is a general trend toward parity. Uh, over the next uh, decade or so, and the DOE Sunshot goals as well, uh, situated there, showing the, the big impact it could have. But what we see in the blue dots most recently is a marked decrease below historical price uh, declines, and that's driven in part by the recent market dynamics, the entry of China as a major player into the market. Uh, so we have a situation where prices are falling a lot faster than historic uh, uh, trends would indicate, uh, a lot faster than costs are coming down, uh, this is a bit of an artificial situation, this doubling within the last year or so. Uh, that's a little bit of an artificial situation, but the general trend of cost reduction and price reduction is definitely holding. And it's hard for me to see at the very far right of the top graph where mm. you have the cost meeting the residential mm. price today. What's the date under there? So the date under there is, is, is sometime around 2020 where business as usual, but with uh, the Dewey Sunshot goals, it's, it's uh, accelerated. You're, you're hitting more of the market by 2020 than just, uh, than just residential. So your projection is that unsubsidized solar would reach average grid parity prices in nine years. For residential. I mean, For residential. You're, you're already there Rooftop, in several markets. You're about yeah, that. you're already there in several markets today. Um, would say one and a half states of the union, uh, you can already install solar on residential and, and turn a profit. Unsubsidized. With, with unsubsidized with the right financing in place. If you have access to capital uh, at a reasonable rate, uh, say at, at market rates, you can install and make money from day one. And this would be in places where there's a high uh, insulation, if that's the right term. High insulation and high electricity prices today, okay. such as uh, Hawaii and uh, say tiers four and five California. Um, what the really exciting news is coming up within this next decade, if, if current trends continue, uh, and if, if, the, the, uh, if there's a certain stability in the market that, that would allow uh, uh, what, what I might refer to later on in this conversation as a more regular growth of the industry, um, we'll be seeing much larger markets, uh, New York, Texas, uh, other tiers within California, turn on, and that should be very exciting as well. Uh, but we won't get there without uh, some, some uh, market innovation. Well, well, that was my next question. So you've drawn the graph where the two lines intersect in 2020. Mm. Um, what's required to keep that line, which represents solar costs, moving downward? I mean, do we need 
what, what's needed? Well, uh, a couple of things. First off, I can speak directly to the cost and to the role of innovation. I can also speak to the current market dynamics um, that, uh, that, are, that are a bit troubling in the sense that they, they present the potential to disrupt uh, the innovation cycle that we have going on in the United States. If you look at that drastic price reduction that's occurred from 2008 to 2011, uh, that, during that period of time, you've seen some, uh, uh, say, low-cost Asian manufacturers ramping up from 5-10% of the world market to 50-60% of the world market behind very, very large government-backed uh, manufacturing initiatives. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, the entire PV industry today is around $100 billion. Uh, this was an injection of about $50 billion by the Chinese government into the local industry. Um, what that does is it buys down today's technology and makes it more difficult for tomorrow's technology, which might be inherently better, to compete on that open playing field. And so you can push companies that were otherwise expecting that nice, steady uh, free market decline, you can push companies out of business um, because of that, uh, I would say, artificial disruption. And so it's very important to maintain a, a fair playing field, uh, to maintain a very level uh, playing field so that uh, innovation can happen and, and flourish. So just to, to make sure I understand what you're saying, in effect, the, the massive Chinese subsidy for today's solar technology is good news in the short term if I want to put solar on my roof, but will retard the progress we need to bring solar costs down over time. Is that that's, that's a fair a, summary? That's a good way of stating it, and I would add further that that is the price just for modules. For installations right now, we're still pr prices at around $5.20. So for the installer, it's never been better. You're buying low-cost imported modules at $1.03 per watt, and you're installing them and selling it for $5.20 per watt and, and, and pocketing that difference. So if you're an installer today, thinking the short term, you might oppose any sort of leveling of the playing field. Um, you might say, no, the status quo is quite good, thank you very much. But if you're focused on long-term uh, grid penetration and uh, in national security, uh, you might think otherwise about the current situation. Hmm. So, so I mentioned you were at Evergreen. I guess you had a little experience with Crisis there as well. That's a company that's no longer with us. Is, that, is the story there essentially that that was a company that was pushed out of the market by these Chinese subsidies? Is that your view of it? I would say uh, whenever you're up close and personal with any one specific case, you can't really define shades of gray, there are, or black and white, shall we say, there are always shades of gray involved. Um, and maybe it's best that I not comment on that specific case, given my, my deeper involvement <laughs> with the company from the period of uh, 2005 to 2007, uh, before I joined the faculty at MIT. Uh, but I can say in general, the trend of, uh, if, if you take a, a turnkey manufacturing line that you can buy from an equipment manufacturer and, and buy in bulk and decrease the cost of that existing technology, which might even plateau above, say, even the DOE sunshot goals. It might not reach the, 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 the costs necessary to supply large uh, volumes of, of uh, U.S. electricity, but you subsidize it in the near term, you can push other companies that are working on innovative technologies out of business. Hmm. I'm going to turn to you, Devin, in just one sec, but, uh, but um, Denny, before we do, what's your view, uh, what's your reaction to what Tonio just said about the the long-term danger posed by these massive subsidies vis-a-vis -vis the short-term win for, for some of your member companies today. I, I agree with him. Uh, I mean, we've uh, had uh, folks that have done extensive analysis of, and as part of our U.S. Uh, partnership for renewable energy finance. And the results are, if you look at just the cost of labor and the cost of material for solar uh, energy in Europe and in, uh, in the United States, it's competitive with China. The big difference is in the cost of capital. And that capital is, is really what's responsible, provided by the, uh, the Chinese government, uh, is responsible for this tremendously dramatic uh, downs, downslide in the price of solar. It's artificial. But it has, uh, as you say, Mark, short-term benefits of uh, people more able to afford it. Long-term, it doesn't really get us to the place where solar needs to be to really leverage its full capability. One final comment on that. Tonio mentioned this idea of uh, grid parity. You asked him about grid parity. Grid parity, uh, if it, there's a couple ways of thinking about it. If you say, I want to get down to the price of, let's say, coal-produced electricity. Um, it's going to be a longer time before you get to so-called grid parity. If you want to say, I want to get down to the, the uh, true cost of 
coal-fired electricity, for example, it's going to be a lot faster. And it goes into this idea, again, of taking into account the externalities. So if you really want to have a level playing field to compete all renewable energies against our existing portfolio of electricity production and transportation energy, you need to really think about the total cost, not just what you're paying uh, on your utility bill, not what you're paying at the bill at, at, the, at the pump. We are paying those real dollars. We are uh, assuming tremendous health risks, and uh, we're doing it uh, in, a, in a way that actually inhibits the deployment of clean energy technology. All right, well, we'll get to the policy and, and sure. you know, tax questions in a minute. Um, Devin, actually, that's where you're going to take us now. It is, yeah. Can Slightly I, different can crisis, I guess. You, you sort of see a crisis in sort of the clean energy <laughs> finance innovation world coming at us. Yeah, absolutely. Talk about that a bit. Um, I would say that it's the clean energy market is poised for crisis. And the reason why it's poised for crisis is because of a crash in federal funding for clean energy, which has really grown the market uh, dramatically over the last two or three years. So I have a few slides on the magnitude uh, of that crash, but just a little bit of a background. In terms of the explosive growth that I think we've witnessed in the clean energy market over the last couple of years, from 2008 to 2010, uh, wind power, cumulative wind installations grew by 60%. Solar power installations in the United States grew by a whopping 120%. And so people have kind of framed this as, you know, this is clean energy's moment. This is the deployment moment in clean energy, the costs are coming down. But I would argue that much of that deployment, particularly through the recession that we've just been experiencing, has been driven by an unprecedented level of federal funding for clean energy. And this is not just from the Stimulus Act, which provided 30 billion dollars in direct expenditure for clean energy technologies, but also from federal programs that we've had on the books for quite a while that are set to expire or reach their volumetric limits over the next couple of years. Uh, so this is a graph showing the difference between funding levels from 2002 to 2008. This data comes from the Environmental Law Institute, which put this together. And then the graph, or the bar on the right, is actually original research uh, from the Breakthrough Institute. We're releasing a report next month on this federal funding crash and we found that over the six-year period from 2009 to 2014 the federal government will be investing 158 billion dollars in clean energy and of course this public investment leverages much greater investment from the private sector on the order of two three four to one so you can see the scale of investment that has been driven into the clean energy industry as a result of the federal programs that we have uh, that have really sustained the growth rates that we've seen Unfortunately, as our report documents, uh, that is coming to a close. Um, you know, the, the era of big energy subsidies, at least for the time being, seems to be uh, over or declining. So actually 73% of that federal funding that I mentioned, the $158 billion, has already expired uh, or will expire at the end of the year, um, those first three years that you see on the graph there. Um, and the annual change, the annual decrease in funding is about 78% from FY 2009 to FY uh, 2014. Um, so what does, this, what does this mean? And uh, well, what kind of programs are we talking about? Um, many of the programs from uh, ARA, the $30 billion I mentioned in direct spending, we also have things like the production tax credit, which has been instrumental in driving uh, wind uh, technology uh, in the United States, which is a program that's valued about six or seven billion dollars a year. Uh, we have the uh, different loan guarantee programs come under uh, controversy recently, 1703 and 1705. All of these different programs that have driven uh, clean energy technology in the United States, after 2014, what is going to be left? Well, we'll have three of those programs left. We'll have some very politically vulnerable and underfunded research and development programs, of which Arun Majumdar's ARPA-E is part. Uh, we'll have the investment tax credit for solar uh, and other technologies, but that's only available until 2016, and that's going to go away. And so we're left with the R&D programs and some energy efficiency programs. And so the question in my mind is, how are we going to be driving renewable energy technology innovation or even renewable energy technology deployment without the support of these federal programs that have been so instrumental in the past? And I think that this is really a moment of truth 
so to speak, for both the clean energy industry, for businesses, and for policymakers to try to reorient the framework that we have around what is the real goal here. As, as Arun Majumdar uh, so eloquently put it this morning, the real goal is a path to uh, subsidy independence and a path to clean energy that is competitive on cost without subsidy. Because as we've seen, and as the funding cliff, not just in this country, but in many other countries, is demonstrating, there is a political tolerance threshold to a lot of these uh, major investments in clean energy, and it seems like we're running up against that threshold right now. So this is a really big question about how do we regroup and how do we focus on the real goal. And I'm really excited about the conversations that we're going to be having throughout the day because much of that is going to be about how do we structure the institutions to do that, how do we find the political will to do that, um, and, and, and how do we stave off this coming crisis in clean now energy? Now you're, of course, assuming no government action when you make these projections. And, and admittedly, we're in a, in a new moment now in Washington where you know the debt crisis is kind of uh, blocking out all the other sunlight. But, but if you had done this graph in 2008 and projected forward, you would have found very little money five years from now as well, correct? Uh, yeah, so I'm assuming no government action. I, I'm not, I am not mm. confident that, for example, we're going to get an extension of the production tax credit for the next four years. Um, I think that there are actually problems, and we'll be talking about this a lot today as well in other panels, with the structure of the incentives that we have today because they're not optimized to drive innovation in energy technology. So even if we have an extension of the production tax credit for another, another couple of years, we're going to be coming up against this problem time and again because there's there's not consistency with the policy, and the policy is not optimized to drive innovation and drive down the cost of these technologies. We're in, instead, we're deploying the technologies that we have today rather than investing in the technologies of tomorrow. And actually, one statistic that um, David Victor, a, a government or a energy uh, expert at the UC San Diego, uh, has written about is that around the world, worldwide, seven eighths of investment in clean energy goes to the deployment of existing technologies rather than the deployment of innovative technologies or the development of new technologies. Our research uh, from the Breakthrough Institute on our report actually shows something very similar. 80% of the funding, the $158 billion in funding that we've documented, goes to the deployment of existing technologies, not innovation uh, and, and the deployment of, of more innovative technologies. Okay, well, let me... Uh, I'm, I'm, there's no question that most of the money is going to, to today's technologies rather than R&D. Um, and, and in fact, that, you know, I, I was going to ask, I, I will ask you the question, you know, are we spending that money wisely? But then I want to come back with, with the other point of view. You know, I live on a very shady street in Bethesda, Maryland, mostly with the 1% as neighbors, not the 99%. And if I decided to put some solar bling on my roof to show what a good environmentalist I was, I'd get support from the federal government, I'd get support from the state of Maryland, I'd do very little for energy independence or you know, climate change because I don't get any sunlight on my roof. Um, what, does that, what do those kinds of policies accomplish in, given that? I, I have to agree with your sentiment. I mean, one of the things that you know, Dr. Ashton said, said this morning is that it's not America warming, it's global warming, and that the wealthy individuals in this country who can afford to put solar panels on their roofs, I think it's all well and fine to do that, and you should be encouraged to do that, or you should be able to do that with the money that you have, but that's not a policy for driving down the costs of solar panels or clean energy to levels in which they would be adopted by the developing world. Uh, it's not a policy for even most of the people in, in this country because it's exorbitantly expensive. But um, a lot of those tax credits are quite expensive. I'm sure Denny would give you the counter argument, but let me give it to you. My friends in the environmental movement would say, you know, we're, we're in a climate crisis that every day we don't act is a day lost and the problem becomes difficult to solve. Um, don't we need to continue to subsidize the technologies we have today just to slow the growth in, in emissions that we're seeing every year? I mean, I think the number for 2010 was up 6% globally. So I think that's... Denny, do you want to... Yeah, and then... We, we do need to continue uh, to invest in that, but we need to do it innovatively and, uh, and wisely and efficiently. Um, some of our uh, our government policies, especially at the federal level, are uh, what I would call blunt instruments. We had a program several years ago called Cash for Clunkers, 
and uh, it was marginally effective. It was, it was effective in helping the, uh, the auto industry. That was a primary benefit. But in terms of reducing our consumption of oil, it was very ineffective if it had been fine-tuned a little bit so that you get your clunker traded in, but you've got to buy something that uh, really uh, increases the, the gas mileage and, and fuel efficiency, uh, that would have been a much better program. The bright spots here, I think, about policy are happening at, uh, in many of the states. Not all, but, but many of the states. California, eighth largest economy in the world, has the first United States cap and trade program that is being implemented. And uh, that is a state that uh, bears a great deal of watching to see how well it does in terms of uh, its environmental quality, its economic strength, and uh, its deployment of uh, innovative technology. Um, I want to ask one more question of the three of you, and then I want to encourage people to write down questions. And I'm not quite sure how they're going to be brought up here, but they will be, I'm told. So raise your hand. hand just you. Someone will come and get it. So if you want to write down a question, just put your hand up and someone will pick it up. Um, this is a really basic question, but I hear from, again, my friends in the environmental movement, we have all the technology we need. I mean, this is sort of goes to Rob's slide in the beginning. No, the real cost isn't. The real cost of clean energy remains higher than dirty energy. But if we had the political will, we could address, you know, the energy independence and the climate problem today. The whole theme here is innovation, which would suggest that we don't have the technology we need. Who's right and who's wrong in that conversation? Let me start with you, Tonio, and just move right across. Can we switch the slides again? Can we switch the slides back to the other person? I think you, someone here has the clicker. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm Great. sorry. So I can't speak for uh, all energy technologies, but I can speak for solar. And speak uh, up, too. Um, yep. So uh, the minute the slides get back on, uh, I'll present a few um, uh, graphs to my point. But suffice to say, I, I see this more of a, a long-term versus a short-term vision argument, right? This is the difference between where we're going long-term in 10 years. That's, <laughs> it's, it's almost comical that I'm now referring to long-term as 10 years, but it's certainly longer than the time constant of the two to four year uh, attention span. Um, the, uh, what we're showing right here is the 2012 uh, cost of manufacturing today's technology, crystal silicon PV technology here in the United States, dropping to 2020, that's line of sight innovation. The 2020 LOS is that second bar right there, representing the cost of manufacturing uh, technology in the United States in, in 2020, down to about 88 cents per watt peak. That's not gonna happen by accident. That's a lot of manufacturing innovation that needs to go on, a lot of applied research that needs to go on, but we're still not going to reach the DOE sunshot goals. And we know that that's important if we're going to address broad markets within the United States. To get there, we have to address a, a few additional points, those green bars, if you will, in the waterfall plot, to get us down to about 50 cents per watt peak on the module level. In other words, those green bars are not just going to happen by accident. They're happening because of R&D investments by the federal government in innovation. Um, the, even, even the decline, the so-called line of sight innovation, a lot of that is applied R&D. Uh, these are innovations that companies might not be able to do on their own, uh, but they can do with the support of the government, not only in terms of, of, of cash, but also in terms of creating collaborative networks and uh, connections between universities, national laboratories, and industry. So this right here, I think, is a, a solid argument, uh, at least in the 10-year span horizon, that we're not going to be reaching massive large-scale grid penetration in the United States if we solely rely on a short-term policy. Now, um, what so are you're saying we do need, you're saying we definitely need innovation. We definitely need innovation in the realm of PV. That would be my argument. So uh, if I owned a supermarket and I said, Tony, I, I could spend a half million dollars today and put solar on my roof or I could wait five years, you would tell me what? I would tell you, depends what market you're in right now. In, in the markets that are profitable today, uh, go for it. Um, if you have additional costs that uh, you have to overcome, or if you have a risk, um, your, your product is going to spoil, your customers are going to leave if, 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 you, have, if you don't have solar on your roof, uh, think about it. Um, but what I can say is that innovation is needed to get down to the point where we can start giving solar panels to everybody on the street. Right now, there are only four people in my neighborhood who have solar. Um, I'd like to see everybody have solar, and that can only happen, I think, with innovation. Danny, do you agree with this point of view that clean energy, quote unquote, isn't ready for prime time? No, I don't. Well, uh, I, I, I don't oh, think that was my point. That no, no, it's not, not your ready point. For prime time, yeah, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I think that we. But I think it's the theme of the day, in a sense, sure. that we need a lot of innovation to get the change we need. And and again, there are other people who say 
No, it's just a matter of politics to get us where we need to go. Innovation in energy, uh, in my view, effectively creates much more attractiveness for consumers and for elected officials, policymakers, to move to the future, away from the status quo. Uh, change is, uh, is a scary thing. And uh, in order to, uh, to get beyond uh, that fear of the future and beyond the, uh, the tight fists wrapped around our, uh, our current er energy portfolio, we need to have attractiveness of, of, uh, of innovation. Innovation in financial mechanisms, innovation in technology, and how that technology is uh, developed and deployed. So we do have today great technologies across the energy spectrum that are not being deployed because a lot of capital, tens of billions of dollars, is sitting on the sidelines waiting for the risk of that investment to come down. That's where the policies come in. If we can reduce the risks of investors in companies that uh, want to scale up with innovative policy, whether that's helping to create market demand through mandates, think RPS or RES, or by reducing the cost of capital through uh, tax incentives like the 1603 program, that is a good thing. It's really, really important to recognize that it's not just innovation in technology, it's innovation in policy, it's innovation in uh, financial mechanisms, and blending those in the right combination. But we have lots of good things that we could do for our national security, economic security, and environmental security right today that uh, we just lack one thing, and that is the political will. What innovation will do is help to push through that uh, lack of political will and make that future uh, energy portfolio much more attractive. Yeah, so I'd Kevin, say, yep, and I have a, I can't take any more questions now. I've got about 50 here, so thank you. So I'd say two things on that point. The first is that <clears throat> I think that we should not be separating R&D and deployment as somehow R&D being innovation and deployment is not innovation. Okay. Um, but I do think we need to have a broader conversation in this country with respect to our policy environment as to how to do deployment yeah. in a way that drives innovation and how to conceptualize deployment as part of the innovation process. So rather than the production tax credit or even the 1603 program, which has been very, very helpful for the wind and solar industries in the midst of the recession, we should, uh, you know, that those, those grants are going to companies that will deploy conventional wind turbines. And rather than targeting those subsidies at uh, more innovative designs, kind of first of their, first of their kind uh, technologies. And to, to Denny's point, I completely agree. There are a lot of technologies in the pipeline that are not getting the financing that they need to scale up. And there are institutions uh, and financing mechanisms that we need to be creating to help those technologies bridge the valleys, with the so-called valleys of death to get across the commercialization hurdle to scale up and see if they can prove themselves at scale and come down in, uh, in cost. Um, so, so I agree, we need to take a, a systems-wide perspective here and conceptualize deployment as part of the innovation process, which is something that we'll be hearing, I think, explicitly about today and some of the other panels. The second thing I'd say just so briefly, that, yes. Let sorry. me just ask you about that. So you're saying not, you know, now you're really beginning to talk about a very targeted, right process with people in the Department of Energy making a distinction between deployment of today's technology and cutting edge technology, you will hear a lot of pushback from, you know, not only conservatives but others saying that's a level of delegation that we don't want to give to any government agency. It's, it's, it may be well-meaning and wrong, it may be politicized. I mean, is, is that really what you're suggesting, that we can design a program like that that makes those kinds of distinctions? Well, so let me tell you, there's actually already a program that's been proposed that's similar to this that would actually ideally circumvent some of the, question, the problems that you're, you're mentioning, and that's the Clean Energy Deployment Administration, which was proposed in the Senate Energy Committee by Senator Bingaman and, and Senator Murkowski on the Republican side, and actually passed out of the Energy Committee on a bipartisan basis. And that 
that would essentially act as uh, a bank that would uh, fund more innovative technologies. The, the mandate is providing the capital to help more innovative technologies prove themselves at scale for the first time. Uh, that's, that's different from uh, you know, what we have today with a lot of our policies. Uh, and ideally, that would be an independently run uh, immune from political influence type of institution. Yeah, kind of like those uh, are the kinds of things we do need to be striving for. Like yeah. Fanny and Freddie, right? <laughs> I I heard uh, Mark that um, there's a lot of in some people's minds a lot of change in the future for the Department of Energy. For example, I heard that uh, Governor Rick Perry wanted to rename it and call it Oops. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a lot of questions here. I'm going to try and whip through these, but let's try, there are maybe 20 for 15 minutes, so let's try and make the answers as snappy as we can, as if we were on television. So, Tonio, is there a quality difference between Chinese PV and American PV components? If so, are they truly substitutes in an economic sense? Okay, so you have to look at uh, Chinese manufacturing as not being some monolithic entity, but divided between tier one, two, and three. Um, I wouldn't want a tier three panel in my house, but me personally, but uh, the tier one uh, manufacturers are producing high quality materials that have been, or high quality panels that have been tested and certified in uh, independent laboratories in Germany and the United States. So they pass certifications, um, they're considered safe, and they're considered what is called bankable. If you'd want to see the market signal, it's really Really whether or not large installers in the United States are putting them up in power purchase agreements where they're on the hook uh, if something goes wrong with the panels. And I know of several tier one manufacturers in China that are uh, exporting their product to the United States uh, through the installers in the US. Uh, Denny, I'll give you this one. Please speak to the tax expenditure subsidies for fossils um, as a cost differential like externality. I think that means just. Um, yeah. Does it make any sense to continue to subsidize a 120-year-old industry, oil and gas? Not in my mind. In fact, if we want to continue to subsidize them, we should change the name from subsidy to entitlement. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there were good reasons uh, for having those uh, subsidies or incentives way back when, but uh, uh, let's just say the world has moved uh, beyond those reasons. So if you wanted to, one, one way to level the playing field would be, let's remove all energy subsidies. Let's just get rid of all of them for, for renewable energy, for, uh, for oil and gas and coal. The, leveling, the playing field is still not level because the, uh, the fossil fuel industries are mature industries. They've got capital, they've got infrastructure, they've got distribution and customer base. So what we would need is to level, truly level a playing field is to remove all subsidies. That's great. Save some money. But let's put a price on carbon. Let's impose a uh, carbon tax that has rebate capabilities to uh, smooth out the turbulence of change for those most industries and individuals most affected. That is a level playing field that um, clean energy technology will absolutely take us to the future faster. You know, Devin, the, uh, I have to ask you about this because the other advantage of a carbon tax, uh, uh, Wayne Leonard, the CEO of Entergy, big utility company, was here last week saying he'd like a carbon tax, is not only would it favor um, ACOR's uh, uh, members, but it would uh, advantage, say, natural gas over coal, which none of those policies you have up there do today, but despite the climate benefits, mm -hmm. it would advantage nuclear vis-a-vis -vis natural gas or coal, which has certainly climate benefits as well. Yet I, I perceive, and perhaps I'm not, perhaps this is a misperception, that Breakthrough has been very um, skeptical about the idea of a carbon tax or cap and trade. Why? Well, I think that first we need to understand what a carbon price could actually accomplish, and particularly what a carbon price at levels that political economies, not just in the United States but around the world, will be willing to sustain can accomplish. And one of the reasons why we are, we are not against a carbon price, but we are recognize the political limitations to increasing the price of carbon uh, to levels that would actually have a large effect or a relatively large effect on pulling some of the more mature higher cost clean energy technologies into the market. Anywhere around the world that you look that has imposed a carbon price, it has been so low to have essentially been completely ineffectual. If you look at Australia, for example, they just passed a national carbon tax. It's $6 per ton of carbon dioxide, which is the equivalent of about 
six cents on a, on a gallon of gasoline. And you have to ask yourself, if you go to the pump next week and gas is six cents higher, is it going to change your, your behavior very much as to whether you're going to buy that gas or and drive a gasoline car? No escalator built into it? That's not just the starting price? They have, uh, over the, uh, the next three years, they're going to be transforming the carbon price into a cap and trade type system that would have a, an effective price of, I think, around $15 per ton. The issue with the cap and trade system, as in Australia, similar to the one that we were thinking about proposing in the United States, is that there are so many international offsets, loopholes, mechanisms that essentially depress the price of carbon, the effective price of carbon, as to make it completely ineffectual. And the problem with that is that if you rebate all of the money and have an ineffective carbon price, then you're not really doing much for clean energy. What we have proposed for quite some time is a small charge on carbon, whether it's two, five dollars per ton, using the very substantial revenues that could be generated from that price, upwards of 50, 60 billion dollars, for a lot of the investments that we're talking about that need to happen, to bring new technologies through the valley of death, to give ARPA-E more money to do the amazing work that they're doing uh, now. So, so it's a carbon price that recognizes that, a carbon price, yes, can help some of the most mature technologies move into the market, but if you're talking about innovation and driving down the cost of those technologies with the institutions that we're talking about, that's going to require a lot of funding and any carbon price that you can actually institute politically is not going to get you there on its own. So this is the so-called iron law of carbon politics or whatever The it is. iron law of climate policy according to University of Colorado professor Roger Pilkey Jr. You will never get a tax high enough to do the job is yes. the argument. Yes. Okay. Um, a couple of questions for either Tonio or Denny. Um, there are several here that say they are around the question of backup for wind and solar. Um, no one's looking at the costs of uh, storage, which is another innovation opportunity, or backup. Do you take that the variability into account in the the, the cost curves that you're looking at and? Then, Denny, your comment on the intermittency issue. How, how high could renewables get under today with today's technology? Sure. So you have examples already uh, around the world in, in uh, Lanai, in uh, Bavaria, in Germany, uh, where you have high levels of grid penetration. And people are studying exactly what uh, PV does to the grid. And it turns out if you have one house and a little cloud goes over, say, for example, the 2.2 kilowatt peak system on my roof, one cloud goes over, all of a sudden you get this catastrophic drop in the power output versus time. And everybody freaks out thinking that you know, PV is, is completely unpredictable. Uh, what NRL has found in analyzing data from uh, distributed systems is that if you start averaging many systems together, uh, the, the ensemble becomes more predictable. That doesn't mean that we don't need storage. That means we have to work on storage, but within a more sophisticated uh, uh, context. And I might mention uh, you can add storage companies together with all these other companies that are innovating right here. And, and we need a long-term perspective on this. We really need a 10-year perspective. We, we can't be undisciplined and lose focus and forget what we know is, 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 is correct. We, we should have dialogue and debate and discuss and improve. But just because the political crisis of the day uh, makes a particular topic un unfavorable, the truth remains that there's, there's a, 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 some paths are better than others, and we should have the confidence and courage to proceed. I wanted to provide some, uh, some positive messages. These are examples of company or of, of innovation areas, um, and there are plenty. In that first row up there where it says uh, silicon usage, you can barely see those little diagrams, there are 20 companies innovating in the United States, some funded by ARPA-E, not to even mention the other components underneath. There are a lot of people doing a lot of good work. One of our projects with uh, a local company up in the New England area uh, was very successful starting in 2009 to 2011, and they just got bought out by Applied Materials for $5 billion. So you have examples of successes around the country. It is a troubling time. It is a challenging time, but we will really shoot ourselves in the foot if we lack the discipline to do what is right and to keep a consistent long-term policy that sends clear, consistent market signals to the industry and provides that sustained level of, of uh, support for the innovation that is needed to uh, fuel our renewable energy economy. Mark, so briefly, that'll... one of the yeah, best ways Let me ways try to... and focus it a little yeah. bit, Denny, the, sure. so I just respect our audience here. He yeah. says, at what point of solar wind penetration does storage become a showstopper? Uh, it's a lot higher than it is now. <laughs> uh, I would say, uh, you know, upwards of, uh, of 25 or 30 percent. And uh, you mentioned uh, an energy source that is going to be critical to this in terms of getting much faster and further 
in terms of uh, s solar, wind, and all uh, renewable energy penetration, natural gas. That is a great firming mechanism, and it's being done a lot more these days. Uh, storage is uh, happening in many different forms, and as that starts to uh, get uh, developed and de deployed uh, in uh, greater numbers, natural gas, is a, natural gas and renewables is a great way to uh, transition, if you will, to a uh, cleaner future. To put a precise number on it, probably 15 to 30 percent is numbers that I've heard tossed around. For each or oh, in no, total? For, for, for PV, if you were to Oh, you could get to 15 to 30 just for PV. On, on a larger area grid, assuming it's reasonably distributed and you don't have all that concentrated in one local subnet of your, your, your grid. Devin, let me try to get you to at least address a couple of big questions about competitiveness in the economy, and I'll, I'll just read them and dive in wherever you want. Okay. If government investment in renewables will drop by 77% between now and 2014, what does this mean for U.S. global competitive vis -vis competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China and India? And then the other question here is a jobs question. Um, if clean renewable energy is implemented to technological capacity, Please share how many dirty jobs, pipelines, refining, mining, and military would be lost for good. And the, the per same person judging by the handwriting goes on to say, is this loss of jobs the real reason why policy doesn't support energy? So does the jobs argument cut both ways? Jobs and competitiveness, is that maybe a way to look at those questions? Yeah, let me uh, try to take the, the first one uh, first. I mean, I think it's important to keep, uh, when people talk about the clean energy race and clean energy competitiveness, it's important to keep our eye on what the real prize here is. We can talk about who's going to be competitive for the subsidized solar market that China is driving in the 21st century, in the next 10 years. Uh, who's going to be competitive at those prices? And that market size might be 100, 200 billion dollars. But when you talk about what the real market opportunity here is and what I think the real race here is, it's the race to make clean energy technologies cheap enough for the global energy market. And that's a market that's now valued at five trillion dollars, expected to grow 20 or 50 percent over the next 20 or 30 years as, as uh, more developing countries uh, demand greater energy. And that's a market that is as of yet untapped because in my view our technologies that we have today are too high cost in terms of clean energy technologies or do not perform well enough to tap that market on an unsubsidized basis. And that's where we need to get to. So I think that a lot of the talk about, about clean energy competitiveness sometimes gets sucked into this frame of who's investing more money in today's technology. Um, I don't think the United States can afford to invest the amount of money that China is investing, but a lot of that money is going to conventional crystalline silicon PV, for example. Uh, the real race here, I think, is who is going to out-innovate which country is going to out-innovate the others or which countries are going to out-innovate the others to supply clean, cheap electricity to the rest of the world on an unsubsidized basis. I think that's the kind of prize that we need to have our, have our eye on. Okay. And, and it's, 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 we're, okay. I'm going to interrupt you because we're just about out of time and I'm going to just ask each of you one last question and the answer has to be like 30 seconds. Imagine like the clock is tipping, ticking in the Republican or Democratic presidential debate. You've got 30 seconds left and the question is, by any uh, reasonable assumptions, you're all saying we need to spend money now to provide a better energy future for the United States. There are going to be costs one way or another. What's the best political argument to, to win that debate? Uh, so I think why should we spend money today for a clean energy tomorrow? How should we spend no, it? No, why? why? Uh, Why should I pay more taxes today for a clean energy tomorrow? Well, yes. because there are, well, so first of all, there's a question about, about paying more and how you pay more today and whether that's within the, the current system that we have. So for example, expanding domestic drilling might be a compromise if the revenues from that go to clean energy development for the technologies of tomorrow. But I think as we've, as we've uh, talked about today, there are many reasons to be supporting energy innovation that go far beyond climate change as well. Uh, economic or energy security, uh, economic competitiveness, public health is a very salient issue among people. So we don't have to all agree on the reason to do it to agree on doing it. If we don't invest in cl the clean energy economy, we are going to be a less secure and a less prosperous nation much sooner than we think. 
Well, there's a political candidate of the future. Tonio. <laughs> I would say, uh, number one, climate, but then again, I'm speaking from MIT. Um, from the policy side, I would say the biggest argument is that most of the wars uh, over the last uh, century have been fought over securing fuel sources, right? Maybe over the last 50 years have been fought over securing our source of energy. Um, do we want to maintain uh, that within our own hands, or do we want to uh, roll the dice? Uh, rolling the dice hasn't worked out for us that great so far. Okay. Great. Well, please join me in thanking the panel. We'll bring Rob back up. Thank you all. Great job. Moderation. Thank you to the panel. We're going to take a 15-minute break. We'll reconvene here at 10:45 with a panel on how we're going to go about doing all this. Thank you.